All right, hello everyone. Uh, this is April still the 28th, and um, for those of you who have been used to seeing me on Facebook uh, go live, um, that's no longer an issue. I have been uh, counseled out, shut down. I don't meet the community standards. I speak of, about God and the scriptures. Therefore, not compromising, but making a statement, you'll notice I have put uh, my little web page for telling you that you where you could uh, post your questions and my YouTube channel. But I also have on there for those of you that are listening that this video or these videos are for educational purposes. If you have any questions, please address questions too, and then we have my address. Um, hopefully you could see and read this, and uh, do feel free to do that. We did cancel church today. Uh, as far as the sermon and teaching, we spent the entire service praise and worshiping God and praying for one of our members' child, children, child, uh, went into the hospital and was in pretty serious condition. Then we went there and prayed for him. Uh, that being said, we got back. I uh, took some issues, handled some issues, you know, taking the dog out, etc., etc. And I thought I'd come in and preach this to some of you um, that are looking forward to this online um, we'll talk about it t next week also so I'll give you uh, my perception um, won't go near as long we have nobody in the audience to um, give me co uh, comments questions can't see in their eyes and see the confusion etc etc um, that being said we are um, in the book of Revelation and we have been going uh, chapter by chapter verse by verse and we're up to chapter 15 last week we did two verses one and two this week we're doing three and four um, yes I am we are going slow uh, however, there's a reason for it, and of course that reason is to um, make sure you read the scripture uh, correctly and with understanding. So, um, we got here this scripture 3 and 4. I think I'm going to, since it's probably going to go quicker, I think I'm going to go back and just read the uh, go to chapter 15 if I could find it there and start reading at verse 1 and where it says um, and I saw another sign in heavens great and marvelous seven angels having seven last plagues for in them filled up the wrath of God and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having the harps of God so we this was what we did last week and we were talking about you know these saints are Christians that have been raptured and they have the harps of God to enter into battle and we enter into battle with praise and worship we're going to be somewhat kind of like what Joshua did when he entered the promised land and his first battle was against Jericho and Jericho uh, fell down and nobody raised a uh, a sword to him but Jericho fell by the praise and worship of God uh, go feel free to go uh, look at last week's sermon and pick up on that okay so now we get into this week so they're they're on a sea of glass 
they're seeing uh, the uh, uh, oh. these angels with the the plagues the the uh, filled with uh, well how can let me go to back to verse one and it says then I saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them fill up the wrath of God so these servants Christians from uh, Jesus's resurrection up until the last person that comes to Christ and then are all raptured are with God they've overcome the mark of the beast they've overcome his image and they overcome the name a number of his name and they have harps of God now it says here in verse 3 and they sang the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works Lord God Almighty, just and true are they wise, thou King of the saints. So first thing when someone's reading this, we're not studying it yet, but you're making little notes. Maybe you're making notes on your little piece of paper alongside you. It says they sing two songs, or they sing a singular song that has been called by two different names, and both of them described how great and marvelous the works of God Almighty are, right? So it doesn't imply that they was, there was a song of Moses plus the song of the Lamb. It says that they were singing a song which is called the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Verse 4 says, that, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, I, we didn't put this in our study, but um, your judgments are made manifest is a, a unique statement in that that means that you see it you see the action so that the, this is a not terribly future event this is like they're right there yes it's in the future but it's like right away in the future you okay buddy i got my dog in here it's it's like there's no more delay this is happening this is when it's done um if you've been like me in the military uh one of the things that we had in the marine corps was hurry up and wait. You would get up at 0430, you would get on the tarmac, full gear, ready to get jump on that airplane so you could parachute out and do some land and you're standing there for hours and hours and hours. And then you call, be called down, you go back home, you go back to your barracks. So a false alarm, uh, you know, don't have to go. And uh, But eventually, there is that time you get on the car mat there is no delay things start going really quick and it's like whoa now you're getting on an airplane now that c-130s you know you're going you're actually inside that c-130 the plane the engine's actually going and then you actually feel it uh, leaving the tar mat and you're flying in the air and you know you're going to battle no ends if it puts this is the way it kind of was represented uh, in Scripture that the saints, they know they're going to battle. It's the time they sing the Song of Moses. So let's go back and kind of re-educate herself with this. The Song of Moses may be referring to the passages found in Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 through 18. Now for my study notes, uh, which you can't get off of Facebook anymore, um, I guess if you send me the email, I will send you my study notes where this is listed. But for now, you could look on your screen and you could see that in Exodus 15, 1 through 18, says, they sang Moses, they sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. 
The horse and the rider hath thrown he threw into the sea. The Lord is my strength and strong song. He is become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him a habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and the host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depth have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. With the blast of thy nostrils, the water were gathered, waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as a heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoils. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Whom is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in the mercy hast led them forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in the strength of thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the habitations of Palestine. Then the dukes of Eden, or Edmund, I'm sorry, shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thy arm they shall be as a stone, till thy people pass over. O Lord, till thy people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in, and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance, and in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands has established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Well, you can see that this song of Moses is actually two parts. It's actually talking about what Christ has done for them, leading them out of Egypt when they came to the Red Sea, at parting the sea, when they went through, the water fell upon the Egyptians and their chariots. Then it goes into a place where God's inhabitants, his inhabitants, where his sanctuary, where he dwells, well, it's true that God, this is a future event because God did not dwell in Jerusalem. God's presence stayed on the ark, but the Ark of the Covenant actually left the land of Israel during the Babylonian uh, time when Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and there has never been the ark since then. Uh, Yet God was still leading them. The Holy Spirit was still leading and protecting them. 
But today, God has made it clear that his dwelling place is in what we call Christians. His dwelling place is the heart of the born-again creation, not in the nation Israel, not in the land of Palestine, not in uh, those that worship a pagan religion, a religion called Judaism, which no longer is a religion worshiping the one and true God, but a God that does not establish and recognize Jesus is Lord. So this is a future, a song of a future event, the Song of the Lamb, as well as a song, song, S-O-N, of a past event of God delivering the Hebrews out of Egypt, the land of Egypt, while they were enslaved. So back to the notes. The Song of Moses is most likely the same song as the Song of Moses speaking of Jesus. So the Song, I'm sorry, the Song of the Lamb, guys. I can't even read my own book, my own writing. The Song of the Lamb is most likely the same song as the Song of Moses speaks of. This song starts out by saying, I will sing unto the Lord. And the word Lord is how the King James uh, indicates the use of what is called a tra 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 tramagnaton. Uh, I could say this a hundred times, and I don't know. Tra tramagnaton. Um, oh, I hate that. that I'm going to say this over and over again, so you guys better just give me a second uh, so that I could say this in some type of clarity, get my brain to remind. I don't do you guys ever have a, after a rough, tough day, not be able to pronounce a word? Let's see what. Ramadan is the use of four individual letters. All right, tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Okay, so that's what it says, a tetragrammaton. And um, hopefully I will be able to say that many times over instead of just this once. Okay, so we can see here the Lord. Um, come on, footnotes work. Uh, it's the Strong's. Uh, if you're taking notes, H thirty sixty eight. Um, you could. It's it's Jehovah, uh, and the Hebrew is Yahweh, or Yehovah. It depends how you want to pronounce it. There's different, uh, many different. A ways to pronounce it. We in English uh, pronounce it Jehovah. Uh, the King James wants to uh, keep this at not being offensive, not taking God's name in vain, and uses the word Lord, it being in the plural form. Okay? Um, for those who don't know or need a little reminder of a tetracram grammaton is the use of four individual letters which have different mean have their own meanings used to describe someone's character so they're not acronyms like we have acronyms and we put uh, letters together for acronyms in the beginning of each letter is a word no uh, this is the beginning of each letter is the meaning of that letter okay so it's not a word it's actually what the letter means now in the hebrew each letter has a meaning uh, letters don't make up words that have meaning letters have meanings making up words a uh, different way of approaching the same thing, the spoken language. But we could then take Hebrew and speak 
and write a novel with numbers because each letter has a number and you would never have to put a comma space period or anything in it. You could just have a one continuous number like on a computer and it would be all right. It would be ex understandable because each letter has a definition. Okay, uh, so before we move forward with the use of this uh, tectogrammaton, it will help us to remember that the Hebrews would not speak or write God's name for fear of misusing it. See, they believed that my computer just doesn't want to go. To this, I don't know why it wants doesn't want to read the highlights. How about that? Look at that, guys. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back here and uh, I'm gonna take this out of this view and I'm going to put it in here where I can. Uh, come into this of course my face is there out of everybody's way in everybody's way not out of everybody way and we could look at in Exodus 20 verse 7 the word says thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain because this is what we call the, one of the uh, the Ten Commandments it, it people just the Jewish people did not want to take a chance those that write, wrote it the scribes not Moses but those that wrote it uh, transcribed it many many times over did not want to take the chance of misusing God's name mispronouncing it or anything out uh, of that nature so they wouldn't say it they uh, actually it even has been said that when the scribes were transposing uh, or rewriting the scriptures you know they were so precise if there was any ever even a mistake even one jot or tittle they would throw away that whole section and start over Furthermore, whenever they came to this word that I'm about to describe, they would get a new pen, a new inkwell, and a new vat of, of ink that has never been used to write this word down because they reverence God's word at being so holy. Therefore, they created this tectogrammaton to describe God. In this case, the four letters used to describe the one being spoken of, the letters are used were YHWH, were chosen. When these letters are put together, they represent the character of God, giving us clarity of whom is being spoken of. Well, you guys, that's fine when you write it down, but how about when you're talking? You realize most people at the time had, had to learn the first five books, the Torah, by word of mouth. Many were blessed to write these scrolls, but these were scrolls, okay? Not everybody, as they moved into the Promised Land, as they spread out, the Father had to tell the children. And it's amazing because it is a sing-song language that it became very accurate. Very accurate. Uh, however, they did have the written form to uh, keep it if the oral traditions kind of uh, moved out in the wrong direction. They could bring them back on track with the written but if you're telling your child about God, what do you say? How do you pronounce Y-H-W-H? And realize Y at this time was not a vowel. It's not a vowel in the Hebrew language, okay? Um, you cannot pronounce a word with no vowels in English. So it, it has become uh, problematic, okay? 
Um, now, for additional information, oh, let's see, the character of God giving the clarity of who's being spoken of. Now, for additional information, the King James to chose to use the English word Lord, all capitals, in the place of this tetragrammaton. Now, the, many people will say, well, Lord is used when it's talking about a plural form of Elohim. And it is. It is also used when it's talking about Jehovah. And we'll see when it's talking about Jehovah, it's in a plural form with a singular meaning. Okay, so it's all very, very interesting. So let's now look at each of these letters, okay, uh, that were used uh, for God. You know, the, each of the letters in the tetragrammaton used for God. Y-H-W-H, starting with the letter Y, it's Yad. This means arms and closed hands to work or throw. So you have arms, closed hands to work and throw. H, hey, man with arms raised to look, reveal, breathe. So you got arms, their hands are closed, but they're raised. I don't know if you could see me in the picture. This has wide enough lens. I have my arms lifted up, kind of like shoulder height going out with my hands closed. To cause or to reveal your breath, your chest. W is tent peg. Our W is wa. Tent pegs to add secure to hook. So the man standing up with arms raised up and they're secured or hooked to something. Hey, the man raised to look, reveal, breathe again. So, what can we say when we put this up? This isn't my notes, but you could say you got a picture of Jesus, a man with his arms raised up, secured with hooks to the cross, and gives up his breath. Sounds like a picture of Jesus. But this is the word that the Hebrew people, scribes, that do not believe Jesus is God, do not believe that he's the manifestation of God, but it describes Jesus. I don't believe this is any coincidence. So when looking at each of the letters of this tetragrammaton, we can see the description of Jesus' work of salvation on the cross. This is no coincidence, but the purposeful proclamation that God was to be crucified on the cross to bring salvation to his people. However, when people wish to talk to each other about the only true God, there arises the need for some vows to be added to this tetragrammaton so that that might be pronounceable this is how the Hebrew word Yehovah and the English word Jehovah came about okay the put vowels now yeah uh, W and H are interchangeable uh, in the uh, Hebrew alphabet with the understanding, many words have been used to describe a singular entity in its plural form, as is the case with family. I'm going to stop there. You know, do you have a family? It's one family. Let's, my last name's Robinson. We have the Robinson family. However, how many people make up the Robinson family? That could be as small as three, not two. It takes a minimum of three, but it could be as large as 10, 20, 100, 
I mean, I could have grandchildren, right? That all have Robinson name and the Robinson family. We come to a reunion. We could have hundreds of people, right? So the word family is singular in a plural form when you talk about a family. So when you talk about the family of God, it's one family is the family of God. Not two families, there's only one family, but it's made up of many individuals. So Elohim is God, is a word describing uh, a singular entity in its form. So it's plural, yes, Elohim is plural, but it's singular in its form. So it's plural in that gods, but it's talking about one God, Jesus. It's not talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Although they are mentioned, and but they are when they are mentioned, there's clarification. So every time I've seen this word Jehovah, it's talking about Jesus, but before Jesus, before Jesus was manifested, before Jesus was born. The spirit that indwelt Jesus, the man Jesus, existed before forever, before the creation of the world. Okay, so thus the word Jehovah is used when referring to the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is God, Elohim, but it's also, I said, it's in reference to just singular form, Jesus which is where we come with the word uh, Yeshua, Yahweh, which is people call the Messianic Jews and stuff. They call, that's who they want to call Jesus, Yeshua, uh, Yahweh, okay? All that is is a shortened form of Jehovah or Yahovah and is referring to the God-man who is their Messiah Christ. So we see this in this Song of Moses when they use Jehovah, they're talking about Jesus, but it's talking about the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but out of that Godhead, it's talking about one individual. So if uh, I have a problem with an individual, he, he belongs to a gang, uh, uh, the Robinson family has been nothing but notorious lawbreakers, uh, pilflers, they're just bad. And here the son comes up and he, he's getting taken into jail for something and he's questioned. And he says, all you Robinsons are the same. He, but he's talking to me. He says, you're a Robinson. We know you have your fingers in this because you're a Robinson. We know you're a drug dealer because you're a Robinson, etc., etc. So that's talking to me personally in a plural form or using a plural word Robinson but using it in a singular form for me personally which is exactly how this word is being used um, let's say Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says here O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord not two not three, one. It's talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus? King of kings, Lord of Lord, the holy and just one. This uh, issue that has been coming up is uh, where Christ, Christ is king. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. It's saying Messiah is king. It's saying Jesus is king. And therefore, this Candace Owens get fired from the Daily Wire because she makes this statement because she's having to work for people that have um, Ju are Judaizers or Juda practice the religion of Judaism. Okay? They do not practice the religion that Moses practices. If they did, Jesus says, I remind you, if they did, if they believed Abraham, if they believed Moses, they would believe him because they spoke of him. So therefore, I strongly believe the Song of Moses 
and the song of the Lamb are one in the same, as it is the proclamation of Jesus' deliverance of his people from which he can pick his bride. So every one of the people that Jesus delivered from Egypt were not to become his bride. As a matter of fact, God was so mad at many of them, he gave them the Ten Commandments that sin would have power to rule over and kill them. Nonetheless, because he made it a, 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 a promise to take them out of Egypt and protect them, he did so, but they wandered in the desert for 40 years until everyone over the age of 20 died. You know, there was no 80 years old, 80 year old people there that lived another 40 years and died at 120. There was no 90 year old people that lived another 40 years and died at 130. There was no 100 year old people there that lived another 40 years and wandered in, this, uh, uh, in the wilderness and died at the age of 140. No, the word of God says when they left, Egypt, they were all transformed into the prime of their life. There was no old or feeble among them. Now, how old is the old, the prime of your life? I don't know. Let's call it 35. Let's call it 40. But it wasn't at the average lifespan of a man 70 to 80 years old. Quite miraculous. They all died except for those under the age of 20. Uh, but they didn't die of old age. They died for one generation. Therefore, I okay, I just, th that's free, okay? Now, verse 3 expounds the Song of Moses uh, and the Lamb, uh, which we already read in Exodus uh, 15 and here it is on the study notes so we won't go back again saying Jesus is king of the saints so verse 3 says that Jesus is king of the saints and I'm prayer paraphrasing great and marvelous are thy works he is the Lord God Almighty whose ways are just and true this phrase, King of the Saints, is most likely the source of the phrase, Christ is King, with Candace Oden used just before her dismissal from the Daily Wire. I want to tell you guys, there is no mistake in that. Um, let me go back here while I'm here instead of moving this back let me just go back to revelations quick and easy this way chapter 15 and look at verse 3 to remind you and they sang the song of moses the servant to god and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are they thy works comma lord god almighty lord god almighty john is saying Jesus is Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the creator of heaven and earth, the one and true and only God. Just and true are thy ways, O King of the saints. Who's the King of the saints? Jesus. This is a bow. Jesus. Now verse 4, let's go back and refresh our memory on verse 4 since I had this up. Verse 4 says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. So all nations are going to come and worship before 
for thee. Does that mean all nations are going to be the bride of Christ? Does that mean all nations shall be saved from destruction? Does that mean that these people and all these nations that come and worship before them are going to receive eternal life? Or are they going to be cast in the lake of fire, which is the second death? Well, let's look at some scripture and see what the word of God says. Verse 4 speaks of a future time when all will fear and worship Jesus as their Lord, but not as their Christ. See, the devil is proclaimed by James, or by the Holy Spirit, you could say, is proclaimed to not only believe Jesus is God, Jesus is the Christ, but trembles before him. But Jesus is not his Christ. See, Christ is your Savior, your Deliverer. Jesus is not delivering Satan from anything. So people will bow down and worship. Every knee will bow. But that just because they bow and worship Jesus does not mean that they, as Lord, doesn't mean that they worship him as their Christ. Now, the end of the book, the book of Revelations, right? The end of the book tells us Jesus will reign over all mankind, providing peace and prosperity to all. Yet, their worship is compulsory, not free willing. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 and 17 talks about this millennium reign. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth there unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So God is going to force these people, not with the whip, but if they want their crops to grow, to come and worship the saints, those that are ruling and reigning with them. All those that came up against Jerusalem, the saints, thou are us. Remember it said king of the saints, okay? Once Satan, so, so we have this period, right? People are, are worshiping God. And they're doing it for a thousand years. So this is generation after generation. There is death, there are children being born, but there's no miscarriages. Right, but people live to be a bright uh, old age. It says a man will be to a hundred. An uh, infant will live to be a hundred years old. An old man at the gate, a hundred years old. He's not going to die of cancer. He is going to die of old age. Okay. So once Satan is released from this pit after a millennium, that's a thousand years, the people of the earth align themselves once again with him, and rebel against God. Can you imagine that? They have peace. Some people are born and have no, no reference of anything hard. No famine, no, no uh, hard times, no crop failures. They have nothing, unless of course they don't come and worship God and rain doesn't fall on them. But for those that do, they have no knowledge of that. But Satan, when he's released, they for some reason gravitate towards him, align themselves up with them, and fight against God and the saints. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and 8 tell us, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. 
Gog and Magog to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So these are not going to gather demons. These are going to gather nations that have been deceived. So many people say when Satan's released, he goes and gathers his demons that weren't cast in the uh, prison. And that is not true. They have already been cast into the pit. Not the prison that Satan is, but the pit. Okay, and they go and gather human beings that are not in the temple, that are outside of the temple, that are not ruling and reigning with Christ, but being ruled and reigned over by Christians. Now, but this uh, rebel ends abruptly. Really, it's not like the the rebellion that's been going on since before the foundations of the earth, the war in heaven between Satan or Lucifer at the time between Adam and Eve as they join into that rebellion and has last for thousands of years, some four thousand years until Christ came. This rebellion ends abruptly as there are no captives involved as was the case of Adam. See, Jesus didn't have to die and redeem anybody. Everybody that is going to be redeemed has already been redeemed. There's no advantage to pro, uh, keeping this on and therefore God reacts immediately and calls fire down from heaven. Therefore, it is met abruptly with the all-consuming fire of God which comes down from heaven and destroys them all. Again, chapter 20 of Revelation, read in verse 9. And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and belo the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. They all died, guys. Yet they didn't receive the second death. But they all died. There was none that were saved. Nobody gets saved after the tribulation. No, or after the rapture. Nobody gets saved during the great tribulation. Nobody gets saved during the millennium. Everyone that teaches that is a false teacher and a false prophet. Only those that are raptured are the bride of Christ. But that doesn't mean they're not going to be blessed. That doesn't mean they're not going to enjoy the salvation of the, of the world. That means that the people are not going to be able to live on earth without Satan on earth. Like when God created man on the six days, Satan wasn't a problem. You know, it's, millenniums is kind of, kind of be like that first uh, creation but Adam's not going to be in control, or the first Adam's not going to be in control, but the second Adam is Jesus Christ. Uh, let's get back to this, though. Yeah, this is not their end, for there is still a time of judgment where every created being's knees will bow and confess Jesus is Lord. Every created being. That means Lucifer. Satan, the demons, the false prophets, Cain, you know, as in Cain who killed Abel, to the last person devoured by God. Romans chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, As I live, says this, the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Jesus is Lord and Christ. Jesus is King of King. Every knee will bow to him. That does not mean every knee will serve him. Every, uh, those that bow to him will serve him, follow him. Satan will bow, but he will be cast in the lake of fire. Now this confession is not that of repentance, 
but justification of God's judgment against Satan, his demons, and all who follow him. This judgment is final without repentance that they will be cast in the lake of fire for their annihilation. Annihilation, which is the second death. Revelations 20, verse 10, 14, and 15. Verse 10 says, And the devil that deceiveth them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There is no third death. There is no uh, eternal life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me get back up there. Into the lake of fire. Now we're going to jump to tw chapter 21 of Revelation and look at verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Amen. If you're not in Christ you're going into the lake of fire. If you're a liar you're going into the lake of fire. I've said many times I hate liars. God hates liars. God will destroy liars. These are talking about people who are not new creations. These are talking about people that were created. Liars, deceivers, followers of Satan. And even though Satan's removed from them for a time period, once he's brought back, they will follow him. Because when they worship God, they were lying in their heart. Now the good news is those who are in Christ will not partake in the second death, but reign with Christ forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, the rapture. Of such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. That is plain, is clear. So this brings me to my conclusion. Jesus is Lord of Lords. The world has a lot of Lords. Jesus is Lord of Lord. Okay, so what's a Lord, guys? Is he a taskmaster? He could be, but a Lord's a protector, a provider. More of a provider. Uh, you look at English, uh, the way they did, you had Lords, many Lords. Well, they had a bunch of fields, a, a bunch, a large portion of land, and they had their peasants. And the peasants would farm and grow and produce uh, that, and he would provide armies and protection and laws for their peasants who uh, took care of the, the, the lords and gave money, the lords gave money to the kings. So Jesus is not only Lord of Lords, provider of the providers, but he's the king of kings. Every king out there, everybody out there has got to give homage to God Almighty. And uh, he's the king over all creation. This is what it says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. 
who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. creature. For by him were all things created, and that are in heaven, and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So this scripture is saying that Jesus, the spirit that is in Jesus, created everything and created everything for himself, for his own pleasure. He is the preeminence. He's the firstborn over. He has rule and authority. He is Lord of Lords. He takes care of it. And Kings of Kings, he has the last word. This is not as the Jehovah Witnesses take this scripture and twist it to say that Jesus uh, is the is the Son of God and the, uh, the first of God's creation, that God the Father created Jesus. It does not say that. It says Jesus is God and he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Now my second point is Christ is Lord of Lord, King of Kings of his bride which, and I said Christ, first I said Jesus, now I say Christ. Christ, it only refers to his bride, that those are people that he saved to be his bride. Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings of his bride, which he redeemed from the power of darkness and the curse of the law enabling us to receive the Holy Spirit having the forgiveness of sins. This is amazing. It says in Galatians chapter 13, thir chapter 3 verse 13 and 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Wait a minute, I thought he's redeemed us from sin. No, it says he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Remember, sin did had no power until it got the law. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14, that, why did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law? being hung on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You got to be born again to receive the Holy Spirit. You could believe in God all you want. You could keep the Ten Commandments. You could keep 613 commandments and you will not receive the Holy Spirit. You have to be free of the law, free of the curse of the law, that you can have the possibility to receive the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus came, God came, he was born of a virgin, he died a sinless perfect life, and he rose to, from the dead to be with the Father forever and ever sending his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise, back onto earth to not dwell among us, but to dwell inside of us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now Jesus, my uh, third point, Jesus is referred to Jehovah, the I Am, before he was conceived in Mary's womb. So, from uh, Genesis 1.1, up to Matthew, Jesus was considered Jehovah. Let's look at some scriptures here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth 
when they were created, and in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. Thou Lord God, Jehovah, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over every creation. Jesus is the image of God. For by him, so man was created in God's image. Jesus was created in God's image. God became a man created in God's image. For by him all things were created. Let me get, just get this. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or power. All things were created by him and for him. This just totally wipes out Mormon's belief that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. That God created both Jesus and Lucifer. No, Jesus created Lucifer. According to the mighty word of God, holy, true, without error, Jesus created Lucifer. Everything in heaven, everything on the earth, everything that's visible, and everything that's invisible, Jesus created. My last point is after his conception in Mary's womb, remember the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and conceived, Mary became conceived, she had conception in her womb. Then Jesus is referred as to Yahweh, is salvation. Joshua is salvation. The Lord is salvation. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8 says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. This is in reference to the rest of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not give people under the law the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to become, God had to become a man in being conceived of a human being without the DNA or genealogy of the power of sin passed down by Adam, but one that can move on this world without the power of sin, without sin reigning over him. Just as when male and female were created on the sixth day, sin did not reign over them. I hope this is a complete understanding and uh, that Jesus is God. Now, every created being, including his enemies, Satan, his demons, and all who follow him, will bow the knee to Jesus. You know, we've read the end of the book. Jesus wins. So that, Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now this isn't Philippians, this isn't even in Revelation. Paul is, is writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wins. The battle's not over, guys. You got to get up. You got to fight. You got to go to battle. The battle will be over. We will win, and there will be casualties. You will be countered as a martyr for Christ. My last point is it will be better for you to confess Jesus as Lord and follow him today. 2 Corinthians says in chapter 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard of thee a, in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation. I have secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of your salvation.
It's better for you to confess Jesus is Lord and follow him today than confess he is Lord and follow the devil into the lake of fire. Remember Revelations 20, verse 10 and 14 through 15 say, and the devil that deceived them, if you're deceived, you don't know it, but God has given you this information that he is a deceiver, cast, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now these are the ones we read earlier in, in Revelation, the beast, the false prophet, okay? Now verse 14 says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell, it's talking about beings, not a circumstance. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not become his bride. You are not filled with the Holy Spirit. You are not holy and righteous. You are not sinless, free of sin. You will be cast into the lake of fire with all the other murderers and liars and fornicators. Now 21 of Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, believing, the unbelieving, those that do not believe that there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the warm, whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death um, this is not a kumbaya praise god he's so good and awesome this is god is a man of war and you are going to bow to him much better to bow to him as your savior than your uh, condemner or uh, executor, I should say. You're already condemned. Be blessed. I'm, I'm going to be preaching the same thing again next week, but to a live audience. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be other inputs into it. Bye now.